Well, it's a real privilege to be here um, to talk about Frink and to be riding the wave of, um, of interest that seems to be, uh, that this seems to be uh, part of the, the beginning of, certainly not the crest. I'm also very grateful to my uh, fellow panellists for really opening up the tactile um, and sort of the deep alchemic and material aspects of some of the things about Frink's work that I want to talk about today. I want to return to the, the title of this symposium, Afterlife, because that word is, is a prompting word. Uh, it immediately throws us into <coughs> contemplation of posterity, of mortality, of ghostly presences, like the, uh, the exit lights which are flickering, that which is and that which is still. I think it's interesting that some of that sense of the ghostliness and the hauntedness of Frink's work and enduring legacy has been something of a, a leitmotif today. The earthy weight of Frink's bronzes, which is my main focus today, seems at first to pull against such thoughts. The sculptures assert their mass, obstinate objects, impervious to the contingencies of time and place. And as we've heard a little bit, Frink was resolutely not a part of the performances and happenings the deliberate ephemerality that characterised some of the sculptural and performative works in the 1960s. The roughened surfaces of her unswervingly figurative sculptures, pitted and worked over with chisels, surforms and scrapers, embody a powerful paradox, the object marked by time through the processes of its development, but which has reached a state of near imperishability. They clasp their afterlives close around them. Nor is Frink's art an art of the esoteric. It avoids the oblique, the obtuse, the strategically obscure. Avoiding the juxtapositionary logic of symbolism and surrealism, her human and animal figures are grounded in what we might call a countrywoman's eye for anatomical realism. Yet her work, and especially her sculptural work, contains a sense of enactment and encounter. It resonates with an air of the sacred, so the title of my talk, Touching Magic, is both a reference and a response to Rilke's description of the haunted exceptionalism of modern sculpture as he found it in Rodin. Composing his study of Rodin in 1903, the 28-year-old Rilke wrote, and let's see if I can do this, hooray. Sculpture was an object that could exist for itself alone, and it was well to give it entirely the character of a complete thing about which one could walk, and which one could look at from all sides. And yet it had to distinguish itself somehow from other things, the ordinary things which everyone could touch. It had to become unimpeachable, sacrosanct, separated from chance and time through that which, rose, through which it rose, isolated and miraculous, like the face of a seer. Now, as my drawing on Rilke suggests, I want to approach this discussion from a literary vantage point, asking not so much what were the literary stimuli for Frink's works, but how did Frink's engagement with literature, and I mean that in the widest sense of myth and story as rival narrative media of expression, shape her artistic responses? This, it turns out, is something of a tricky question. In a 1973 interview discussing the sources of her inspiration, Frink pro proclaimed, I usually get a kick off from something that happens, a photograph or a person. I'm not literary. None of them are myths. In this statement, Frink constructs an account of her art as a response to event, something that happens, a photograph, a person, rather than as an embodiment of an ongoing external narrative. None of them are myths. Such a construction works, I think understandably, to affect some sense of agency over the outward ripples of her art objects. But there's plenty of evidence for Frink's imaginative involvement with myth, with her interest in archetype, some of which we've already heard. Spring was her favorite time of year with its green promise and its rites of renewal. Her instinctive interest in rebirth was given a specific literary impetus by the poet William Anderson, whose study of the green man Frink read while in hospital in March 1991, several months after her diagnosis with cancer. As Gardner puts it in his official biography of Frink, the book's record of a quest for an archetype fascinated her and took her over totally. I like that sense of possession innate in that description. 
she went on to invite Anderson for lunch at Walland House to discuss the book uh, and served him a lunch in which every course was a different shade of green, which is rather a nice touch. This fascination, of course, uh, bore fruit in Frink's series of green men, uh, the, the screen prints uh, that Kip was talking about and showing us, as well as in her green men sculptures. But I think Frink, perhaps fairly, saw this immersion in a direct literary source as an exception to her own general resistance to external mythic influence. She said, what I think I'm doing is creating my own myths. I'm not the slightest bit interested in other people's myths. I'm not interested in the Greek myths. It's too literary. None of my things is to do with ancient myths. With the possible exception of the green man, I just work out of my own head. But as, and I think there's no better artist than Frink to illustrate this, uh, of course, the artist's head is a far more open and receptive space than this statement might seem to allow. Like Hughes, Ted Hughes, the poet whose shadow is a constant presence in this talk, Frink demonstrated how an imaginative immersion in some forms of classicism could bear fruit. Consider her series of Riachi warriors, and I think I, I probably don't need to talk uh, too much about them given their presence today. Uh, but also, she, she chose to illustrate uh, various stories like the Canterbury Tales, the Odyssey, the Iliad, and Children of the Gods, which, all of which choices, I think, suggest a deep sensitivity to the creative potential of classical myth and of mythic cycles. So I hope that I can, uh, this, this afternoon, draw out some of the moments in Frink's life, as a sculptor in particular, that combine to illustrate something fundamental to her art, which might justify what I see as my impertinence in ascribing a mythic or a literary sensibility in contravention of her own very clear and forthright uh, self-descriptions. Animating constraints of shape and structure to give external expression to human thought. But beyond this point, the forms diverge in increasingly unmanageable ways. One typically literary way of thinking through this divergence is via the concept of ekphrasis. That is, the literary representation of verbal or, or plastic artistic representations, poems about sculptures, poems about paintings, for example. James Heffernan, whose book, Museum of Words, provides a useful guide to theorizing ekphrastic relationships, attributes a paragonal energy to the intersection of the verbal and the visual, an energy of struggle between rival modes of representation. And certainly, ekphrastic interactions tend to throw up thorny problems of the relationship between description and depiction, and between word image and object. My sense is that in each uh, mode of representation, there's something covetous. There's a desire to absorb uh, a feature of the other so that fixed forms of visual art existing in their own stillness through time feel their lack of narrative momentum. While literary forms reliant on language, wonder and perhaps doubt the capacity of words to encompass that which they try to represent. Indeed, much of the matter of ekphrastic poetry has traditionally been the expression of just this doubt. Jack Gilbert's poem, The Forgotten Dialect of the Heart, for example, concludes that what we feel most has no name but amber, archers, cinnamon, horses, and birds. Now, to speak of art forms as covetous, as conscious of their own limitations, is perhaps a dangerously unscholarly way to think about them. But in doing so, I'm trying to grasp towards exactly that appreciation of a life within form that nourishes Elizabeth Frink's art and shapes her idiosyncratic artistic vision. In an interview, Frink spoke of a sense of containment, of energy inside her sculptures, and of her instinct that each piece is now a kind of vessel. And I think this relates rather nicely to some of the alchemaic or uh, ma magical contexts for the creation of and casting of brass that we've already heard about. In his ekphrastic poem, Archaic Torso of Apollo, Rilke refers to a sculpture's kindling magic, an apt metaphor for the catalytic impact of plastic art on poetry. But I'm concerned here, rather, with touching, with the haptic magic of sculpture, because I'm fascinated, as a, and I, it's obviously a fascination that's quite shared, uh, by the energy that is embodied in the equipoise of Frink's sculptures on the boundary between those ordinary things which everyone can touch and the isolated, 
and miraculous objects that rise like the face of a seer. I see this magic, like touch, as a dynamic of reciprocity, an exchange that unfolds both immediately and across time. And I think that dynamic was really interestingly illustrated by the idea that, that bronze can draw heat from the human body when, when touched and held. So that sense of, of touch and the tactile lasts both uh, through its processes of creation and later appreciation. As Frink said, my series are my narratives. I'm very bad at what, putting what I want to say into words. What I'm doing is trying to set up a kind of encounter with the spectator, a dialogue between my sculptures and the public. People have to add part of themselves to make it work. My contribution to today's discussion then is to suggest that part of the animating tension characteristic of Frink's work stems from a productively unacknowledged or underacknowledged reverse ekphrasis, by which her sculptures attempt to absorb and embody literature's narrative capacity for temporal projection, to manifest what Wallace Stevens called the life that is fluent in even the winteriest bronze. In particular, I want to suggest that this process is enacted in the surfaces of Frink's sculptural works, in their conflation of the tactile and the sequential. Uh, this is the magic, I think, that she embodies, the magic of origin and of existence and of afterlife. Some of Frink's animals, some of the, the dogs and horses in particular of her middle period, are quite smooth. When her bronzes shade into verisimilitude in this way, I think they lose much of their energy, what R Brian Robertson describes as their sense of survival, of endurance and alertness. Frink herself observed that my sculptures depend more on the texture of movement than on form something arrested, that's what I think I'm trying to get, something slightly caged in. The interaction of surface and space here is key. When, during the 1980s, Frink became interested in experimenting with colour, she lamented that paint means putting on extra skin on top of the surface. Patinating chemicals were, as we've heard, much to be preferred because they react directly with the surface that you have. So there's no, no mediation between, uh, between object and external world. So I want then to go on to consider the evolution of a subset of Frink's sculptures, the bird-like ones, to, uh, to borrow a phrase from Rilke. We might begin by asking why it was that Frink was so persistently drawn to birds as subjects for her art. One answer might be to say that they exist in a liminal space between earth and sky, as heavy and light as the air in which they live. More specifically, Frink's predatory bird forms occupy the conceptual field of the raven and the carrion crow. In many traditional tribal cultures, including the folkloric tradition of the British Isles, but looking outwards from that, this is not a, not a parochial mythology, the crow and his cognates, the rook and the raven, were creators and tricksters. Crows are the bringers of light, the makers of things, transformers, magicians, shamans and healers. The anthropologist Claude Levi Strauss proposed a structuralist theory that suggests that the raven obtained such mythic status because it was a mediator animal between life and death. In an article to introduce his first book of poems, The Hawk in the Rain from 1957, Ted Hughes wrote that what excites my imagination is the war between vitality and death and my poems may be said to celebrate the exploits of the warriors on both sides. And I think this, this could almost be a, an epigraph to, to a, a catalogue of Frink's work because it seems so apposite to what she was also doing. This complex of associations forms the basis of Frink's interest in many savage and totemic animals. Her menagerie of dogs, boars and horses could, I think, stand as a primer in the Celtic and classical myth. But her sculptures of birds are distinguished from her other animals in that they carry and merge with the human in ways that the other animals do not. I ascribe this, at least in part, to the association of birds with language, both due to their mediating role and to their human-like cunning. Ravens are birds of prophecy in both the Hellenic and the Norse traditions. They're sacred to Apollo and, of course, famously, are the god Odin's familiars, Hugin and Munin, thought and memory. Their association with the speaking head of the Celtic brand, the Blessed, supposedly buried under the White Hill of London, accounts in the uncanny logic of folklore 
for the urgency with which ravens are still uh, kept present in the Tower of London to this day. Frank's monumental heads, which she explicitly linked in interviews with the, the Celtic cult of the head, I think present another angle on this interest in submerged and contained prophetic speech within the mute object. Coming back to Bird. This bird is resolutely avian in its sinister lines and in the protrusive jut of its head. The battlefield scavenger that I think this represents anticipates the darkest and most visceral iterations of Ted Hughes' crow poems. Yet its primary impact at this point in Crink's artistic development is still zoological rather than metaphorical. It draws on a visual language of sharp beaks and rooted talons. The ridges and cross hatchings on its torso speak to feathers pressed by the winds rather than of any when it's gutted. The crow of a man, he says, in other words, is the essential man, only minus his human looking vehicle his bones and muscles. Given Frink's background growing up in rural Suffolk, where she'd walk through the fields shooting rabbits and other game for the family pot, I think it's reasonable to assume that she would have been familiar with this meaning of the word. If we are to re-examine for a moment Frink's bird in these terms, then the linkage between her threatening sinister male figures and these animal studies, particularly these predatory birds, becomes much clearer. We might say that this is the assassin reduced to its totemic animal innards. Dead Hen, from 1956, takes this semiotic configuration further. Frink described the piece as a funny bird, almost abstract. I think the abstraction doesn't lie so much in the anatomical contours, which are realistic <laughs> enough, but in its figuring of the transformation from living creature to an agglomeration of flesh. Dead hen appears as a twist of viscera thrown into sudden and violent relation with an external world. The mortification with which the legs and the beak stick up into space punctures the dry air with the energy of decomposition, which is an interesting and, and uh, sort of tension in, in comp artistic creation, decomposition. I was struck recently, and I think this is another example of the, the visual symmetries between Frink's work and, and other works, uh, by the affinity between this sculpture and a photograph of an amulet made by a Greenlandic shaman in the 19th century and composed of the head and uh, the feet of a raven. They share some kind of deathly geometry, I think, so turbulent and dishevelled as to promise a continuing form of action. Frink's sculptures rather like this, perhaps more so than this, look both touchable and touched. In this way, I think they surmount the practical reality that as spectators, we're rarely allowed to touch works of art. They carry the marks of encounter on their superficies. Frink's surface, I think in this respect, uh, positioned as she is in this moment of modernism, are peculiarly of her time in the exploration of contingency from the Latin contigere, to have contact with the dynamic of mutuality between self and world that simultaneously frames and extends the experience of the perceiving subject. This magic of a simula simulated tactile encounter allows Frink's work to overcome the deadness of unmoving matter. I'd also go so far as to suggest that in this respect, Frink's art can be thought of as a neo-shamanic practice, albeit without an overt spiritual intentionality of the sacred object, although it stops short of a process of reification. It's art engaged in the hybridization and manifestation of the potentialities between human and animal forms. Produced close to a decade after Bird, Frink's small bird from 1961 is a much more troublingly familiar creature. Its composite energy and kinship with the human imbues it with the aura of a shamanic object. The talons, as you'll note, have receded. The indeterminate feet are now buried in the mud of its base, its beginnings. The legs, fragile and pitted, have a very human muscularity about them, even as they recede into the spaces between them. The head, emerging from the carapace of the body like a cicada from hibernation, remains, I think, uncertain as to what it should be. The momentum in hearing in its sheer planes contains the possibility that this might be the billowing shawls of a dancer caught in a forward plunge. It suggests, as Ted Hughes's poem Two Legends has it, 
a black rainbow bent in emptiness over emptiness, but flying. A fascination with hybridity and with the protean possibilities of man and beast and plant underlie much of her work. Speaking about her magnificent mirages, Frink said, on the Camargues, you get these extraordinary heat hazes and you see these creatures which seem to be sort of birds or a person or a tree. Any of those make up this extraordinary stalking shape that shimmers across. And it's fascinating to see what it will emerge. You just look up and sometimes it was a man on a horse or it was a bird, one of those long egrets or one of those umbrella pines desert, uh, distorted. This lyrical description of a fluid world caught in the light and heat of creative possibility belies Frink's resistance to mythic readings of her art. She said in an interview, I prefer the animal side of man, but the birds and birdmen are all tied together. I get fed up when people say, oh, Icarus, or something tralala, <laughs> because they've got nothing to do with it. I mean, the birdman was originally Valentin, you know, the chap who used to fall out of airplanes and finally killed himself. Well, that's what got me on that, pure and simple. From birds to him, the idea of the t what was Icarus but a man attempting to fly and evolve. By the time we arrive at Bird 1966, which is the last of my images, we perceive the perfect proleptic balance of movement and memory. Although distinct as an entity in space, the creature is unconstrained. It might be a fragment of a broken hind rearing on its back legs, a frozen action, perhaps. It may be a human figure contracting into an avian frame, or a birdman birthing itself from the center, a pelican birth. What is clear is that this bird is not animal so much as Ovidian myth made matter, part of a rich mythic tradition of metamorphosis. I want to end by closing the circle with an example of the way that Frink's sculptural art influenced the literary. So I'll finish by reading an extract from a poem by Ted Hughes, This Game of Chess, which was uncollected until recently and which was written in response to three of Frink's bronze heads. Whose are these heads? These three fates of a single life or two guardians and a single soul? One soul and its two angels? the good and the bad, or the doppelgangers of a god and two thieves come too early. Who shall win this game of chess? The trinity are blinded by the triple face of a goddess and a goddess and a goddess. Thank you very much. if you could comment further or explain for someone who didn't quite understand it, the idea of reverse ekphrasis. So how the sculpture can illuminate a poem. <laughs> Perhaps breaks this open in a way I hadn't gotten to before, is the idea not only of series, where Frink was quite conscious that her series were a form of narrative, but also in her um, two-dimensional art, the way that, that paint is layered or ink is layered, potentially also creates that ability to move through time. Uh, because of course, narrative moving through time is, is what is absent in the fixed uh, visual form in, in a way that, that uh, poetry doesn't think it, it has. Of course, that distinction is a lot more complex than, than we might think. I mean, a poem is in, in, certainly a written poem is a fixed object also, but in the way that it unfolds both on the page and in the way that we speak it, has a, an, an existence through time as well. Hi, Sarah. I was just interested in the correlation between the um, crucifixion paintings by Blake, uh, by Bacon and Sutherland that are in the later 40s, and I know one of them is in the 5th. Uh, they just seem to have a very similar 
form to them and energy to them. And as a Catholic, she's obviously going to be thinking back in some form to these sorts of images. I was also thinking about the Egyptian myth of creation and the Benun bird when it lands and causes the dawn. And this, to me, really seems a striking symbol of creation and the beginning of, of light, really. Mm -hmm. I, I had been thinking about that same mythos from a different cultural point, uh, the idea of the raven in um, northwestern uh, American uh, tribal uh, folklore, where the raven <coughs> actually keeps worrying at a hole in what is the, the sort of the whiteness of the of the world before there's anything in it and pulls out a thread and pulls out a thread until this hole opens up and that hole creates the world. So it, it, I think that's sort of a reverse image of, of darkness coming into the world or substance um, through that sort of process. I think what's interesting about Frink's repeated uh, verbal resistance to the mythic is that she doesn't like the idea of predetermined narrative. Um, she wants to be able to exist within a mythic sphere and create her own practice within that, which I think is why it's much more related to the shamanic than myth per se, because she, she, she pushes against the boundaries of what she sees as predetermination. And so the, the Catholic iconography is important to her, but also needs to have a sort of ontic openness where she can get outside of its immediate context and do other things with it. So maybe that's why she's interested in archetypes, but not myths or that there's a problem with myth is too literary because it's too set. I think maybe that's what's happening. 